friends, welcome to our series, Acts and Us. You'll notice a slightly different location, but the same book. We are studying the book of Acts, and we're doing it week by week. Now, last week, we talked about advancing through adversity. Persecution had come on this young church, and they were spread everywhere. In Acts 8, 3, and 4, we, we read this. Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And those who had been scattered preached the word everywhere they went. And that was amazing because just when we thought things were coming to an end, that Saul was crushing the church and trying to destroy it, which he really was, the Lord was expanding the church. Yes, he let the apostles stay in Jerusalem, but the rest had to go on to Judea and Samaria, thus fulfilling the scripture in Acts 1-8 where Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. So what was meant for evil, God used for good, just like he said in Joseph, uh, to Joseph in Je Genesis 50-20. As a result of this, people were coming to faith. The word was spreading in all directions. And uh, now we're going to meet and get to know the Saul of Tarsus, the same Saul who was the mean-spirited Pharisee who watched the coats of those who were stoning Stephen, the first martyr, as we read earlier. And now he has an experience, a transformative experience. Now, there's a, a TV show called Extreme Makeover. It's for houses and for things like that. Um, but they're actually, they did a version of People, Extreme Makeover for People. And I have a close friend who was on the show. He was on ABC TV, National Network. And uh, they took him, and he had needed a lot of help, some weight loss and image, th things like that. And over the course of a year, they completely transformed my friend. And they changed his, you know, he helped him with his weight, his, his image, his identity, his style, his look, everything. And it was amazing to see how this man was completely transformed into, you know, a TV personality type, or almost like a movie star look. However, he told me when we talked that on the inside, even though he looked great on the outside, on the inside, he felt worse than he ever did. He had wandered far from God in the process. Well, Saul of Tarsus is having the complete opposite makeover. Yes, it's an extreme makeover, but he is changing from the inside out. He was transformed by the Holy Spirit into the man that we know as Paul the Apostle. He started out as an awful, mean-spirited agent of evil, really. He was one of the most uh, diabolical enemies of the church when the church was in just its fledgling state. And then he becomes one of the most powerful men of God who ever lived. Now, he may have looked like the same old Saul of Tarsus, but on the inside, he was a brand new creature. He was completely transformed. So we're going to talk about Saul of Tarsus. Who is he? What is he? All right, they call him Saul of Tarsus. As you know, he becomes Paul the Apostle. He was not one of the twelve. No, he wasn't one of Jesus' twelve apostles um, that walked with him, that lived with him. And that's why he's kind of cool to look at and to think about and to identify with. Because he came to Jesus like we did after Jesus was already dead on the cross, already risen from the dead, and already ascended. He came to Jesus later, just like the rest of us. Yet, he wrote most of the New Testament. How about that? So he was Saul of Tarsus, born approximately AD 5, so he's about 10 years younger than Jesus, in the city of Tarsus in Cilicia, uh, modern-day Turkey. Uh, he was born to Jewish parents who possessed Roman citizenship. Now that was unusual. They were Jews, but they possessed Roman citizenship, assuming they can transfer Roman citizenship to Paul. It had its privileges. Uh, Sometime between A.D. 15 and 20, he began his studies of the Hebrew Scriptures, advanced studies in the city of Jerusalem, so he would have moved to Jerusalem, and he studied under Rabbi Gamaliel, who was a famous rabbi of that day and even of today. Uh, he describes himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews, really a very, very devout Hebrew, as an Israelite, as a Pharisee, when he's talking about his past, and from the tribe of Benjamin, thus his namesake, Saul. King Saul was a Benjaminite, and so was Saul of Tarsus, Benjaminite. And then he also, as we said earlier, he oversaw the stoning of Stephen, and also really was an instigator of early church oppression and persecution. Paul was kind of running it. He ravaged the church. 
Uh, he entered homes of believers. He dragged both men and women. They make a note of that. Luke tells us that it's not just the men that were being persecuted, but women, and throwing them into jail. So let's read a big part of chapter 9 and listen to the story of the transformation, the extreme makeover of Saul of Tarsus. Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Well, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with the authority of the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to, and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. And let's pause there. Amazing courage by Ananias. He actually debated to the Lord whether this is a good idea. The Lord showed him it was. The Lord showed him that Saul was going to be used powerfully. He also said that Saul would suffer some many, many things. And so Ananias, Ananias went to Saul at the house of someone named Judas on Straight Street, laid his hands on him, and Saul was immediately healed. And not only healed, but transformed. And as you notice, he had the scales fall from his eyes, and he got up. And what did he do? The first thing he did to show his proclamation of faith in Jesus, he got baptized. He got baptized. All right, so we'll pick it up in verse 19. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent many days sent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Verse 20, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of the plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his father, followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Now Saul was not just saved. He was transformed. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and he began to preach. And he didn't just preach anything. He preached the two main messages that we see all through scripture ever since Matthew 16 when it was revealed to Peter up in Caesarea Philippi that Jesus is the Messiah that means Christ or Christ is Messiah and the Son of God those two messages Paul proclaimed right there in the city even though it may have cost him his life they immediately wanted to kill him they were searching for him they blocked the gates they were watching his disciples knew so they let him out through a city wall in a basket so that he can escape. Where did he escape to? Well, he escaped to Jerusalem. Verse 26, he's going to Jerusalem. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he told them how Saul 
how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So right away Barnabas is the one that vouches for Saul, who later becomes Paul. Verse 28, so Saul stayed with them, moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. All right, so the Hellenistic Jews are, would, were the kind of the Greek modern age Jews, and even they wanted to kill Saul. Even they wanted to oppose and oppress his message by killing him. Barnabas vouched for him, and once again, the believers helped him escape. This time they took him to Caesarea, to port city, just south of Haifa, and they sent him off to Tarsus. That's his hometown. They figured he might be safe there. But then what happens? Remember I told you early on that this church was being oppressed and scattered? It seemed like it was being destroyed. Paul was, in try Saul was trying to destroy it. Verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. <laughs> it's fantastic because this oppression led to spreading and scattering and yet it was like scattering seeds that are all now growing and flourishing and we just read that it was a time of peace and strengthening. Wow, what a radical change. This radical change in Saul was amazing and it really had tremendous repercussions not only for the early church but the entire New Testament and not only for the New Testament, but throughout history, including us. And he was completely transformed by the Holy Spirit. Just like Peter was completely transformed in, at Pentecost. We saw a completely different Peter. And, we're about, and we are now seeing a completely different Saul. He went from a mean-spirited, murderous, legalistic Pharisee to becoming a humble, servant-hearted, sacrificial Christian man who taught us more about love than anyone besides Jesus. He was the one, as I said in sermons earlier, he's the one that wrote, love is patient, love is kind. He, he was the one that wrote, do all you do in love. He was the one that wrote so beautifully about the love of Jesus. But what about Ananias? We can't forget him. Ananias, who, who was the catalyst, he was the tool that God used to bring Saul and out of his uh, legalism, out of his bondage and free him into being this man. What a brave man Ananias was. Can you imagine if the Lord told you to go to someone who is a diabolical killer, maybe like an ISIS militant or some notorious murderer, and said, hey, go to his house and put your hands on him and pray for him and say, uh, Jesus sent me to you. Can you imagine? He was very courageous. He was loyal. He was faithful. And he had a lot of what we call chutzpah. There's a good Yiddish word for you, chutzpah. And it means audacity or a braven nerve. And he had the audacity, a braven nerve to go and do what the Lord asked him to do, regardless of the danger and the consequences. The Lord told him that this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Now, Ananias did this out of obedience, but the rewards, think about the rewards for that act of obedience. What Paul became was probably way greater than even Ananias could, could have imagined. Well, Paul went to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, yes, but not just there. In every region, starting church movements across Asia Minor and throughout Europe and the Near East, he wrote half of the New Testament. He wrote most of what we know as Christian doctrine, from Romans to Galatians to Ephesians to everything else. He is one of the most read and quoted authors in history, not just in the Bible and not just in Christian history, but he is one of the most read and quoted authors in the history of mankind. He influenced billions of people throughout history and civilization and the modern world, all because Ananias was willing to bravely go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and say, uh, excuse me, Paul, I'm here to pray for you. He was willing to be obedient. He was willing to share the gospel. So what transpired in his heart? How did he get that chutzpah? Well, there was an exchange between Ananias and the Lord. Remember, he debated with the Lord a little bit. There was a hesitancy on the part of Ananias and it took some convincing 
on the part of the Lord. See, Ananias, it was telling God who Saul was and is. And the Lord was responding to Ananias and says, yes, but here is, Saul, here is who Saul is going to be. Here's who he will be. It was back in Acts 9, 15. We read, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. <clears throat> this is after an Ananias said, hey, God, don't you remember who this guy Saul is? He's a murderer. Again, he was, Ananias was telling God who Saul is and was. And God was responding and saying, yes, but here is who he will be. And friends, that's how we have to approach evangelism. When we're preaching the word, we can't just look at people and say, here's who they are and here's who they were. We have to have vision for who they could be. Who they could be if the Lord gets his hand upon them. God can save anyone. And he wants to save everyone. And I'm sure that you've heard of some amazing conversions taking place. You know, we read them in history, gang leaders and Islamic extremists coming to faith, Hindu priests, all kinds of people who had nothing to do with God and come to faith and become great men and women of God. I love to see that. Atheists. I had a friend uh, early when I was younger, much younger. She was a, a, uh, the sister of a friend of mine, a Christian friend of mine. And I... I was speaking to her, preaching to her really about the Lord, and I said to her, why don't you ask God to reveal himself to you and to show Jesus? And she said, how can I even, be I don't believe in Jesus because I don't believe in God. How could I, who am I going to talk to when you tell me to, to seek God? I don't believe in him. I said, well, why don't you just ask him to show you a sign? What's it going to hurt? And now, I did not know what it would be or what would happen. I didn't know what the sign would be. I didn't know if it would happen. But I did have vision for her. I felt, as I watched her, that she'd be a great Christian, you know, like her sister. And so it gave me enough vision to just pour it on a little bit. And I lost touch with her for many years. But I got a letter one day, surprisingly. And she told me that she did what I told her to do. She asked God to show himself to her, reveal himself to her. And God did, and she responded. And since then, she had become a believer. She married a Christian man, and she was in full-time ministry with the International Bible Society, traveling around the world, telling people about Jesus. Amazing. I didn't know it would turn out like that. I just had a little bit of faith and a little chutzpah and just blurted out what I thought God wanted me to say. Friends, you could do that. We could do that regularly. You never know what the response is going to be. We need to ask God to give us vision for him people the way he sees them. Think about how God saw you before you were saved or before you responded. He knew, he knew who you were and he knew how you were, but he also knew what you could be. He knows what each of us can be. He's not as concerned about where people came from. He's more concerned about where people are going or where they're going to be. And that's, I truly believe that when we look at the world, friends, if we can see people as they as God sees them, the potential that they have if they respond to his promises. Wow, we'd probably be a lot more optimistic in our evangelism. And we need to be like that to each other and to unbelievers as well. Have eyes and hearts that don't just dwell on people's present and their past, because then we'd probably just be discouraged. But if we can imagine, ask the Lord to give us vision for what their lives could be, if he gets a hold of them, then we could pray and work and speak toward that end. See, God sees our potential. He knows what he wants to do in each of us and what it will look like when it comes into fruition. I think about uh, those little seed packets that you see in the grocery store sometimes. These are little packets of seeds during the springtime that you buy and you plant. It could be flowers and sometimes it's even vegetables. Like you see a little envelope and has tremendous cucumbers and zucchinis and squash or whatever. And so you take it home and and you look in the packet and you open it up and there's like little gray, ugly little pits, you know, things that look nothing like the fresh fruit on the, on the cover, but they have the potential. It, and you have to imagine what if these little seeds were planted and fertilized and watered in really good soil. And friend, that's how we have to look at people, not just a, a bunch of pits that look worthless and have no potential. God sees each of our potential. 
1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord says, it says this, The Lord does not see things the way we see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I believe he saw Saul, and he saw what Saul could be. And it was the same thing for Peter. Peter was an unschooled fisherman, sometimes defiant, always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, oftentimes being impulsive or impetuous. He was notorious for saying things that seemed to squash the atmosphere, whether it would be on the Mount of Transfiguration, whether it be in Caesarea Philippi and other places, you know, when he would deny Christ right during the night of Jesus' arrest. Yet, Peter was transformed into a power preacher, a strong leader, someone who had just tremendous influence in Jerusalem in the early part of Acts. And here he is spreading out. He's going beyond Jerusalem, and he's, he seems to be become, becoming even more powerful. Let's pick up the chapter as we close out with the last several verses. And it says in verse 32, As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. And there he found a man named Aeneas, and he, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. And Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up. Roll up your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. And all those who lived in Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Here's a man who was crippled. Peter came along and just said, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. And guess what happened? He completely got healed, got up, and everyone saw. So this word is spreading. Now in verse 36, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. And about that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. And Lydda was near Joppa. So the, the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda. They sent two men to, to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the windows, widows, I'm sorry, stood around him crying and showing him their robes and clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the, for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Amazing. He healed this man who had been crippled, bedridden for eight years. He healed or raised a woman named Tabitha or Dorcas from the dead. Amazing things are taking place. Peter was not just used to preach and to teach and to lead the church. Now you see he's doing miracles of healing. And obviously a resurrection took place in front of Peter as God used him for that as well. Amazing things. And again, we say Acts and us. Here's what's happening in Acts. What about us? Now, I don't see people being raised from the dead, but do I believe it can happen? Why not? Why not? I believe God can do anything. We must not limit God in the ways that he wants to use us for his glory. Otherwise, we are really constricting the potential. We have to believe that God can do great things. He wants to do great things. The problem is sometimes some of us feel completely unprepared or unqualified to do great things, to be used by God, to minister to others, to bring healing or teaching or transformation. We just feel unqualified and unequipped and unprepared, and so we just don't say anything. We don't do anything. Maybe it's because we are not eloquent or we feel that we're not educated enough. I don't know. Maybe just because we don't feel worthy because of past sin or present sin. I don't know. But I don't believe God wants us to stop at that and settle for that. Think about Isaiah. Isaiah, the most quoted prophet in the entire Bible. Not just in his book, obviously, but Jesus quoted him. Others quoted Isaiah and continue to. Isaiah. But when he was commissioned in the early part, he felt unworthy. He felt like, I'm the last guy that God could use in the very beginning. Uh, you know, God wanted to, to use somebody and he said, not me, I'm a man of unclean lips. But you know, because he was willing to say, here am I, send me, because he was willing, God made him worthy and did send him out and did use him to transform his generation and every generation since for 3,000 years. And you read about that in Isaiah's commissioning in Acts chapter 6. And it says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord 
high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hands, which he had taken from the tongs, with tongues from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And then I heard of the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Hineni in Hebrew. Verse 9, he said, Go, 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 Isaiah. And Isaiah went. Isaiah did go, and the rest is history. Friends, each one of us has a special calling on our lives. And God wants to commission each one of us for our calling, our purpose, and our destiny. Are you willing to accept that call? Are you willing to say, here am I, send me? Whether you're a man or woman of unclean lips, whether you're unprepared, uneducated, uneloquent, or whatever it might be, can you just say, here am I, send me? And you may be feeling unqualified for your own calling, but remember, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. If you're called, don't worry. You'll get equipped. But just respond in humble obedience. And watch what happens. Ask God to give you three things. Faith. That even the hardest hearts of the people in your life can change. Faith. Second, vision. To have a glimpse of what it would look like if that all happened vision. And then third, courage. As we said earlier, chutzpah. To be willing to speak the right word at the right time to anyone he asks. Courage. God wants to do great things through each of us. Even to use us to change the lives of others who will also go on to do great things and be used to change the lives of even others. And that's how it works. All we need to do is to be willing to be obedient, and watch what he does. He does the rest. God bless you.